Great. So I will just introduce Robert. Robert, uh, he has spent 30 years in environmental in the environmental science division at Argonne National Laboratory. He designed and developed visual resource management me methods and systems and guidance for US federal agencies. I was very excited for him to mention the um, Bureau of Land Management that he, he advised and he <coughs> developed best management practices for reducing impacts for artificial light at night. He currently is a private consultant and as a volunteer, he uh, manages a rooftop pollinator garden and green spaces at the Center on Halstead in Chicago. So Robert, thank you so much for doing this. Um, please let me hand it over to you and I'm gonna mute my Okay. What happened? Nothing. Okay, so hopefully you see my screen at this point. Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, so it's okay for me to get started then? Everyone can hear me? Good. Okay. So uh, first I would like to thank Bia and I'd also like to thank Leslie for the invitation. Um, it is a pleasure to be here and I'd like to thank all of you for um, participating tonight. Hopefully what I have to say will be interesting and uh, useful. So the, <clears throat> let's see, first thing I want to do is to um, talk a little bit about why are we doing this presentation and why now? Uh, so I went on to Google and I put in insect apocalypse and got a bunch of returns. And then I went in and put in uh, bird declines and I got a bunch of returns um, that I listed uh, a few here. And um, I'm not gonna go through all of them, but it's um, very clear that depending on who you talk to, uh, there is an insect apocalypse and um, I know for a fact that there are serious declines in insects, um, whether it is an apocalypse or not uh, remains to be seen. Uh, I am sure most of you have heard also uh, in the last couple of years, but I think even more so in the last year that there are uh, thought to be huge declines in the number of birds in North America. And I imagine most of you are aware that climate change is thought to be um, contributing to this, which it is, um, that habitat loss and um, invasive species and other problems that we're familiar with are um, contributing to these declines. Um, work that I have done has shown that uh, shown me that light pollution is also contributing to these declines, although you don't hear much about that. And um, it, I think, believe that it is an important problem and one that we uh, need to collectively take action on. So, uh, hopefully, there we go. So uh, to get started, I want to let you know that the uh, what I'm going to talk about is based on a book that in theory is going to be published soon by the Department of the Interior Bureau of Land Management um, that I wrote before I retired. Um, that was a very comprehensive look at the environmental impacts of artificial light at night or Allen. So you're going to hear me use the term Allen. That just means human-made light, not natural light. Um, I will use it, I think, interchangeably with light pollution. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that. So the book uh, covers why dark skies and natural darkness are important to humans and wildlife, talks a bit about what light pollution is, and then how light pollution affects uh, human and ecological resources. And then it winds up with the section on best management practices, which is really mitigation measures for reducing the impacts of Allen or, or light pollution. 
So tonight I'm going to focus in, uh, I'm not going to talk about the human impacts of which there are many, including human health and social impacts, economic impacts. I am going to concentrate on uh, what are called ecological impacts of Allen. And uh, I'm going to concentrate a little bit more on insects and birds, although uh, all uh, animals essentially are affected by this. So what, uh, what is the problem? Uh, well, there has been life on Earth for almost 4 billion years. And in that time, all living organisms have evolved with only natural light sources and natural light cycles. That is to say, there's the sun, the moon, and starlight were the only regularly occurring light sources that animals and plants encountered. And the cycle of day and night has been more or less steady, although it has changed gradually over uh, you know, extremely long periods of time. So given that this is really the uh, evolutionary history is with these light sources and light cycles, it turns out that many organisms are highly dependent on these natural light cycles and the levels of light that they involve. So obviously the sun is extremely bright, the moon relatively faint and starlight very faint. But it, there has not been any exposure, evolutionarily speaking, to the uh, range of light uh, in between those values except very briefly with you know, forest fires or lightning or things like that. So light is actually fundamentally important to the health and well-being of almost all living organisms. And it is not only, um, at, it is really at the cellular level, at the level of the individual organism, and also at the population level, that is to say, it is important to the cohesiveness and the health of uh, large numbers of animals collectively, not just the individuals. So artificial light at night or ALIN has only existed for the last couple of hundred years. And there is no precedent for it in the history of the planet or for those living organisms. Now, uh, it has in those 200 years uh, become ubiquitous on, on land, at least, across the planet, and obviously more so in, in some parts or others. But in essence, Allen is now everywhere, and life on Earth has not had any time to adapt to it. Um, and it is now really, in essence, for all uh, purposes, permanent. And it is actually very significant in terms of its magnitude across the globe. So why is natural light and darkness actually so important? Well, we have to think about when animals are active and, and how they live their lives. Most invertebrates, and that would include insects and uh, crustaceans and spiders, and many vertebrate animals, uh, such as birds and mammals and fish, et cetera, are um, actually not primarily active during the day, which is to say they are not diurnal. These organisms are crepuscular, that is they're active mostly in twilight conditions or nocturnal, primarily active at night or both. And so blat, bats, pardon me, are kind of a classic example of an animal that is uh, crepuscular uh, and nocturnal. And there are many other ones. Moths uh, are certainly nocturnal. And uh, for nocturnal animals, some of them have adapted their physiology. They're really, they're at all different levels and their behavior 
to function under low or extremely low light conditions. And again, that includes uh, many, but not all moths, bats, and frogs. Other species, and this includes diurnal species, rely on the natural cycles of daylight and darkness to trigger and regulate behaviors, a whole range of behaviors, hunting, uh, evading predators, mating, nesting, navigating, uh, in the case of birds, certainly migrating, communicating between individuals, and of course, uh, sleeping. And most animals are highly dependent on light to see. That seems pretty obvious, but it also regulates a bunch of other physiological processes and behaviors that are critical to survival. So I've got here a bunch of bats emerging from a cave. Uh, again, they are crepuscular or uh, nocturnal. So where does light and light pollution come in? So um, what I'm talking about here is Allen, that's artificial light at night. And for the most part, we're talking about outdoor lighting, but not entirely. That is either excessive, misdirected, or intrusive, such as it, that it causes some adverse effects, whether that is uh, harm to an animal, uh, making it so that astronomers can't see the night sky, uh, or annoying your neighbors if it's your light uh, shining into their uh, bedroom or property at night. And we can think of light pollution as being unwanted allen, that is unwanted artificial lighting. Often it's wasted light that is not actually reaching its intended target. So if we look at that picture of Chicago that I have uh, at the upper right taken from the John Hancock building, you obviously are looking at a bunch of lighting that is intended for buildings, um, to light interior spaces and street lights, okay? But you can see in the night sky reflected on the clouds, a bunch of that same light. Well, that light that is reflecting on the clouds and obscuring the heavens is not serving a, a useful purpose. It's not hitting any target that it was really intended to hit and it is um, causing problems. That's really what we're talking about with light pollution. Now, when light pollution affects the night sky and makes it harder to see stars and planets, what have you, that is sometimes referred to as astronomical light pollution because it's really affecting astronomical objects and as it happens, astronomers. Um, Light pollution, though, also diminishes natural darkness. That is the darkness that would be occurring in the absence of artificial lighting. And when this uh, artificial lighting causes, uh, or light pollution causes problems that involve making dark places light, we refer to it as ecological light pollution because it is affecting ecological resources. So in this talk, and I think the problem that is really most important for us to address, we're talking primarily about ecological light pollution, that is the loss of natural darkness. But I do want to point out that some birds and insects, in fact, use the stars for navigation. So those effects on obscuring the, the heavens, that is the stars and celestial ob objects, actually uh, can cause a problem for some animals. So the, the lower right picture is obviously a satellite image um, showing artificial light at night. I put that up um, so you can see, a, you know, kind of the distribution, but also you should know that Chicago is, uh, depending on who uh, is measuring it and how, it is arguably the most uh, light polluted metropolitan area in the country. And of course, we're in a, an, an important place for bird migration. Whoops. So 
how does light pollution affect animals? Okay, and so uh, I've got some terms up here. The next five slides are somewhat technical, but I don't think you need to worry about remembering these details. I just want you to get a feel for how uh, animals are impacted and uh, the range of ways they, they can be affected by uh, Allen, um, that is light pollution. So the first one is dark, is called dark repair and recovery impacts. So this is when light, external light, um, suppresses biological repair mechanisms uh, at really at the cellular level in an individual organism. The second class of uh, impacts are what we call photoperiodism and circadian rhythm impacts. So this is the alteration of behaviors that depend on day length and the cycle, uh, the alternating cycle of light and dark um, that uh, occurs daily. The third type of impact is what's called temporal niche partitioning impacts, which is a mouthful. Um, it really kind of boils down to when light causes organisms to be active during periods that they would not normally be active. So for the most part, what we're talking about is diurnal uh, animals, animals that are normally active in, in daylight being active at night. The fourth group are impacts from changes in visual perception. So that I think, uh, I hope is obvious that any animal that sees will have their, um, uh, ability to see affected by changes in light levels, uh, but it is not always better for animals to have more light uh, to see at night. Then the last group of uh, impacts uh, that I will be talking about are what are called impacts on spatial orientation and navigation. And uh, this is very important for both uh, insects and birds and uh, really talks about the ability of animals to navigate um, whether they're flying or on land uh, and to um, control uh, properly their motion uh, through space in the presence of uh, outdoor lighting. So. Um, the next few slides, I'm going to go through uh, each of these types of impacts, give you a short uh, sort of uh, little detail on it, a re-explanation, and then just talk about a couple of examples of this kind of impact. There is uh, synchronicity here. Sometimes these impacts um, work uh, in tandem. Okay, so dark repair and recovery impacts are uh, come about because organisms that are inactive at night, and that would include humans and cats and dogs and ma mammals uh, in particular, they need darkness for health and healthy functioning. So we have um, repair uh, antioxidants and other repair functions going on at the cellular level that require an uninterrupted darkness. And so that's why you'll hear so much about, um, you know, from the medical profession that getting uh, good sleep and un uninterrupted sleep and sleep without uh, extra lighting is so important for your health. Uh, an important example to point out here uh, is that the production of melatonin in animals takes place during darkness. And uh, it is regulated by the amount of light that is being, um, I don't wanna say captured by the organism, but it, the organism is exposed to. Melatonin is a hormone that regulates sleep and it also has a bunch of important immune system functions. In fact, I found out all living organisms, uh, including plants, um, produce melatonin and uh, it is really essential to uh, being alive but also being healthy. 
So exposure to allen in uh, studies that have been done has been shown to suppress immune system response in a variety of animals, but that includes quail, uh, Japanese quail is what the study was done on, uh, cockerels, that is to say young roosters and rats. Now, those aren't the only animals that this has been found in. These are just a few examples. It is the case that a lot of the impacts I'm talking about here have come to light relatively recently, although you might be surprised how far back the research goes. Um, and uh, so uh, we can uh, be confident that at least some other animals are affected by these things. Photoperiodism and circadian rhythm, circadian rhythm impact. So, Photoperiodism is the physiological reaction of organisms to the length of day or night. That is, in essence, how your body responds to uh, the length of the day and um, consequently the length of, of nighttime low lighting. And the organism's response to that cycle of day and night is referred to as circadian rhythm. I imagine most of you have heard that at one point or another. And it is, of course, affected by day length. Um, changes in day length trigger what are called photoperiodic events. That is, uh, some examples being leaf drop in uh, trees in the fall. That's a combination of temperature and day length. Uh, if you have a Christmas cactus, it sets buds in, you know, before Christmas, and that is largely, uh, but not entirely, a function of day length. Certain animals like ptarmigans uh, and foxes uh, and change their color uh, when winter comes on Again, uh, that is affected by day length. And there are, in fact, many, many behaviors across the board as far as animals and plants are concerned um, that uh, are affected or initiated by uh, day length and um, the um, circadian rhythm. So Allen has been shown to delay photoperiodic events such as the time of the dawn chorus in uh, blackbirds is one study that was done. That is when they all begin to uh, start making noise in the morning um, to attract uh, mates and defend territory, et cetera. And then if Allen, uh, it has been shown in fact to, for example, uh, delay um, the, uh, Activity time, if it is lighter later, nocturnal animals uh, don't get going in their active period. And uh, it's been shown to reduce the time that they have available to find mates and also to find food, which obviously will uh, affect their uh, population uh, over time. Um, changes to circadian rhythm can suppress immune system response. So in some ways, similar to the um, kind of thing we're talking about uh, with melatonin, but other kinds of immune system responses, such as suppressing pheromone production and egg laying, that's been established in uh, moss, uh, just as one example. Temporal niche partitioning impacts um, it can be, well, temporal niche partitioning is in essence uh, a fancy way to say time slots for species to be active. So um, you can think of, uh, you know, the fact that something is nocturnal is in essence stating that it is active at night and relatively inactive during the day. But it so happens that there is much finer level of partitioning of the day and night in terms of activity. For example, there are uh, fire that become active um, at a certain light level and then become inactive when it gets darker. And this is a way to make it so that different species of fireflies are not confusing each other's with their 
uh, signals that would be very similar between species. They actually, and it, this is also true for geckos, I know, um, in parts of the world where they have them, uh, that they, uh, certain species have a very narrow window right around sunset that they will hunt and then they stop, they go on to other activities and another species then becomes uh, active and, and does their thing for a, a short period of time. So having artificial light affects niche partition, <laughs> partitioning by sometimes messing up the um, order or you know, it makes us, because it is lighter later, it pushes one uh, species activity period into the activity period of another um, species. Um, and one, of course, that may not be related to it at all. Or it can separate uh, species that would normally interact. Um, so uh, an example being, uh, bat emergence, okay, it's actually the last example on the slide, so I'll get to the swifts. But if um, bats come out of their uh, uh, bat boxes and nests or places where they are hibernacula, um, sorry, I don't know if that's the right term for where they go during the day, but let's just say they emerge at a certain level of darkness that occurs every evening. If there are lights near the entrance to where they are spending uh, the day, um, they will actually delay their emergence and they have less time to forage. And they've established that they actually wind up eating less because they are not foraging as long. Another and a little bit more dramatic example is the common swift. It is a European bird related to our chimney swifts. Um, that is actually a diurnal uh, animal. It is active during the day. That's when it hunts. And they did a really kind of an interesting experiment in Israel uh, where they uh, had swifts at different areas with different levels of Allen, that is different levels of lighting at night, including the whaling wall, which is extremely well illuminated and apparently all night. And what they found is that the swifts extended their period of activity into the night. And in fact, at the whaling wall were active, some were active all night long. So if you think about uh, insects that would also be drawn to um, those brightly lit areas, which I'll talk a, a more about in just a minute, um, and they are now being subjected to predation by these birds, that they would never have uh, interacted with otherwise. And that is just one example. There are many examples and they often have pretty dire consequences for the uh, animals involved. But I will uh, talk about that a bit more. So kind of related to this is, um, in a way at least, there are impacts from enhanced or degraded visual perception. So a lot of uh, predators use vision to find their prey. And they may be benefited by having artificial light at night. And uh, it may actually cause them to change the way they hunt. So uh, I read a, about a study of wading birds, and I, I can't recall where it was exactly or what the birds were. But they apparently have multiple ways to find their prey. Um, they, I don't know if it's by, uh, um, well, one way is, is visually, they look for prey and then they grab it. But they may, for all I know, be uh, getting vibrations of uh, fish in the water or uh, some other kind of stimulus that they use. When they were subjected to um, Allen at night, they actually tend, you know, they compared ones that were in natural lighting and with animals that were in uh, outdoor lit areas. Uh, and they actually changed their hunting strategies to use visual uh, hunting strategies more. And in fact, they were much more successful at catching prey under these lighting conditions 
where they were able to use their visual hunting strategies, which I assume were you know, just more effective than the other ways they might have used to uh, catch prey. In another study using insects, um, we have uh, different species of ladybugs that use different approaches to finding aphids and the other kinds of uh, insects that they eat. And the presence of Allen, at least in an experimental setting, uh, favored ladybugs that used visual methods over those that used other methods to find their prey. So you can, I think, pretty easily see that this, is, this could have huge effects on predator-prey relationships. And in fact, that has been shown uh, scientifically, but also in combination with the um, temporal niche partitioning, I have not only swifts in, the, in that particular example, um, hunting down insects that they uh, would not normally have ever uh, encountered, but also seeing them much more effectively than they would otherwise. And I have uh, at the upper right here, a photo of a common nighthawk. And I put this in for uh, anecdotal purposes. Uh, I uh, lived, I grew up in Wilmette, which is familiar to those of you uh, from this area right near the Baha'i Temple. And uh, many nights I spent down there watching swarms of nighthawks catch clouds of insects that were attracted to the uh, very bright, in essence, searchlights. They were uh, lights to light up the temple to make it visible from uh, all the, the entire area around it. And it was quite bright and you could hear dozens and dozens of nighthawks all the time uh, hunting these insects. And um, I, you know, there's been a serious decline in uh, nighthawks. And uh, I suspect that it is in part because they ate themselves out of prey. Uh, if you imagine this being done on a global scale, we're talking potentially huge uh, effects. Oh, Alan also mass light-based communication that are critical to mating between fireflies, another insect species that is in serious decline. And in this case, it's been established that Alan makes it impossible for females, or it makes it more difficult, I'm sure not entirely impossible. Uh, it can make it totally impossible for them to find mates because they cannot see the um, signals uh, from males or can't distinguish between them. On the kind of 180 degree away from that, some nocturnal frogs um, are adjusted, uh, their vision is adjusted to work in almost complete darkness, as close it would be absolutely pitch black to a human, but their eye and their vision systems are adapted to those extremely low levels of light just like uh, any animal, but uh, we're all familiar with being in the dark and then suddenly turning on the light and how it makes, that, uh, makes it very difficult to see, if not impossible, for a certain amount of time until your eyes get readjusted. Well, if you are uh, an animal and you are prey and you are suddenly exposed to light, you can't afford not to be able to see. And it's been shown that sometimes it can take uh, these certain frogs 45 minutes or an hour to recover their vision. And that obviously could have very dire consequences for them. So this last group of uh, impacts I wanna talk about uh, are uh, impacts on spatial orientation and navigation. And so uh, what that is really addressing is uh, two things that I think we all are familiar with or at least heard about. I'm sure all of us are aware that insects are attracted to lights. Uh, and uh, they're not exactly sure, uh, at least uh, to my knowledge, 
they're not exactly sure why this is the case. There are some theories, but not conclusive evidence. Similarly, certain birds, or uh, I, in, in particular birds that migrate at night, are also attracted to light sources. And in essence, both for insects and at least some birds, they um, in some situations get trapped by the light source. They're ir irresistibly drawn to it and they cannot get away from it. And what they do and what they uh, think, or at least one theory I heard is that they use stationary lights in natural conditions to keep them on track. Let's just say they keep the moon on their right, okay? But if they get exposed to uh, a light and it is not the moon, they wind up trying to orient on this small light source and they really cannot make any headway. In fact, they lose the ability to fly in uh, the direction they would normally go. And what happens, unfortunately, is they wind up dying of exhaustion, or in the case of insects, I think starvation, because they can't go long without food. Um, in uh, collision, uh, if you think of it like a bug zapper light, that's exactly how they work. They use light to attract insects. Um, they fly right into the light and they're ex uh, electrocuted. Um, if it is a very hot light source, they are cooked. <laughs> Um, or, uh, and very significantly, um, predators get them. Because the predators are drawn, they figure out, and this is very well established, that birds and spiders and a variety of predators will gather around light sources and enjoy the bounty of trapped uh, insects there. In the case of birds, um, they are exhibiting the same kind of behavior they seem to be very much more affected by uh, conditions of fog or rain uh, when there are, you cannot see uh, celestial objects. I believe that is what they think is the cause. And there have been cases where thousands have been, bir birds have been killed in a single event. Uh, one that came to mind was a communication tower with guy wires around it that it was at a time when they had steady burning lights, which are a particular problem for birds. And birds went around this for hours and hours, a huge migrating flock, and thousands of them were killed. In the case of insects, I read an estimate, and you know, you have to take these kinds of estimates with a grain of salt because they are very broad estimates, but they estimated in the country of Germany in one season, one, uh, you know, spring and summer and fall season, a hundred billion insects were killed um, through these uh, kinds of impacts at lights uh, in, in just that country of Germany. So I extrapolated myself to assume if we looked at this worldwide, because Germany is only about the size of Oregon, that um, we have to be talking about trillions of insects being killed every year by lights. The estimates for birds are uh, between about 100 million and a billion. Um, there are, of course, far fewer birds than there are insects. And so these are, are huge numbers. And it is pretty well hard to believe that they could not be having very serious effects on um, survival of uh, these animals. Again, uh, looking at the other kind of end of the spectrum, a variety of insects, bats, and other mammals, particularly small animals that tend to be prey, will avoid lit areas. And so um, if we're, I think they did several studies on uh, uh, mice out, uh, desert mice, uh, kangaroo, my, kangaroo rats, sorry, out in the Mojave, and um, they will uh, stay away from lit areas and they wind up eating less uh, because they can't forage in places they, they would normally forage. 
or they have to, you know, they have to go farther and expend more energy to get to uh, the right kind of dark conditions where they feel comfortable engaging in their normal be behavior. Um, I have a picture of a Wita, uh, which is a giant uh, cricket-like creature found in New Zealand. Uh, first of all, because they're really, really cool insects. Um, but uh, to remind me to point out that this is a case of uh, light avoidance, but with a twist. It turns out that male Wita's are much more sensitive to light than female Wita's. And so they will avoid lit areas and the female weed is won't. And that then of course affects their reproductive success. And I just wanna say for talk a minute about the, uh, the tall or taller image on the right, uh, which uh, you probably can't tell at this uh, resolution, but are actually birds, thousands of birds in two spotlights at the 9-11 memorial, uh, sorry, 9-11 memorial uh, in New York. These are colossally bright uh, bluish uh, surge lights in essence that are um, pointed straight up for long periods of time. And um, they did a study uh, with this particular uh, set of light sources and estimated before they turned the lights on, there were 500 birds within the vicinity of these uh, light streams. Uh, and then after they turned the lights on, within just a few minutes, they estimated there were over 15,000 birds, basically endlessly circling up and spiraling up and down in these, uh, these streams of light. And um, it doesn't take a lot to imagine how uh, devastating that can be if uh, they are unable to engage in their normal behavior. And then you repeat this in city after city across the globe. So um, I've been talking about direct effects, that is how the presence of light at night directly affects, um, for the most part, individual organisms. And it's, I hope it's very apparent that the direct effects of Allen uh, light pollution on insects are significant. Dozens, if not hundreds of studies are, are pointing toward that conclusion. And the direct effect on birds are also significant. It's everything from affecting um, when they hunt and how successful they are to when they lay eggs, when they find mates, and their, you know, direct mortality. Uh, but they are also suffering, potentially suffering, the very serious uh, indirect impacts uh, because of the loss of insects. Now, I just got a message that my internet connection was unstable. I am hoping that people can uh, hear me. Um, so, in a few cases where you're you quiver, but you're back on, and uh, I think we just stick it out, you know, and and hopefully I'll, we'll let you know if there's really an issue. Okay, thank you. Um, the uh, uh, the insects, and it is very clear that at least some insects are in serious decline, and this includes pollinators, um, would be really catastrophic. Uh, insects are pollinators, and that includes about uh, sorts of fruits and vegetables, uh, but I believe it's about a third of the food that we eat are crops that are insect uh, pollinated. Insects are waste processors. So we literally would be up to our ears in dung and corpses if we did not have insects eating uh, all of the uh, waste uh, products, you know, in leaves and, and, and dead wood and all sorts of other things, uh, not just animal carcasses. Um, insects uh, disperse seeds. 
uh, and make it uh, possible for many uh, species of plant to uh, be propagated. And they are, although some insects are they control many, many pest species that are critical to our food supply. And then lastly, and I think the key thing um, that I want to get across is really not about people, but it's about for the other animals that share our planet. And insects are a primary food source for birds, small mammals that are in turn, you know, prey for larger mammals and other predators, but also reptiles, fish, and amphibians. And if, I, I, if you know, I uh, can emphasize that it is very important that we prevent, do whatever we can to prevent a catastrophic insect decline, especially in view of the other stressors that all of the um, animals and, and many plants are under with climate change and, and water issues and habitat loss, invasive species, et cetera. So here's where I got to the uh, more positive uh, part of this talk. So I have good news at last, sort of, okay? Um, it is, uh, with respect to the issues I'm discussing, unfortunate that Alan is absolutely indispensable to humanity at this point and it is pervasive. I can't imagine, and I can't imagine anyone really can see themselves functioning without lighting. I don't think at this point that humanity will be willing to do without it. Uh, I did read a great book uh, that is all about, a long book actually, very interesting one about life before there was artificial lighting and what that was like. Um, but anyway, uh, another problem is that our lighting revolution, which overall is a good thing, but we have now very inexpensive LED lighting. Um, and it is uh, because lighting is now much cheaper, it's more energy efficient. Uh, all over the world, people are installing new lights at a very fast rate. Um, it is also the case that not many people are even aware that lighting is an, any kind of ecological problem. And uh, even though they might be sympathetic to trying to take care of the environment, a lot of people don't see insects as really having any value. In fact, a lot of people, if you said that lighting was killing insects would probably be happy. I've had people say that to me. Um, on the other hand, Allen impact mitigation, which is what I'm going to talk about next, is actually very highly effective. It is much less complicated than trying to solve uh, a lot of other kinds of problems, uh, ecological problems that we have, uh, like uh, habitat fragmentation or um, what you do about invasive species. For those things, the, you know, the genie's out of the bottle or the, you know, the, uh, the devil is, is out of the bottle. And um, they've caused all sorts of very complex uh, effects that in essence mean we cannot go back to the condition without these impacts. It, it's impossible. Um, that's not the case with Allen. If you turn a light off, that whatever impact it created is 100% gone. That, that's very important. So, uh, and th most of the mitigation is actually straightforward. It's relative to trying to fix some other ecological problems, very inexpensive. We understand how to do it and we have the technology to do it today. What's also good is Im Allen impact mitigation, which really involves using less light and using light more efficiently and effectively, usually saves money, it saves energy, and it reduces carbon emissions because we aren't using as much energy. Everybody should want to do that now. And it's nice to have uh, a mitigation that everybody will understand if I use less light, I'm saving money. So. That's an advantage. 
And I think importantly, everybody who uses lighting has the ability and the means to help mitigate Allen impacts. And I want to spend the rest of what little time I have uh, talking about um, how you can do that. So um, these slides have like a principle at the top and then some specific practices uh, below with um, some hokey schematic um, graphics that I developed. And the first principle is to use light only when you need it. So that is what your, I, I think most of our parents told us, turn off the light when you leave the room, okay? There is an incredible amount of outdoor lighting on at people's residences and in office buildings and many, many other places that simply is not necessary. It's just on because somebody didn't turn it off, okay? They didn't even occur to them that it should be off. We also have uh, a range of lighting controls that can be used, including motion sensors and timers that are you know, inexpensive, easy to install and operate that will make lights come on for a short period of time or a set period of time and then turn them off when they're not needed. Okay, so you can think and you, know, you can see that any homeowner can uh, do these things at their house. Now, uh, I want to point out that it's particularly important to do this uh, switching off lights or lowering lights, which I'll talk about more later, during times of critical biological activity. So for birds, that is during bird migration and a number of US cities have programs where, uh, at least in their downtown areas, they are turning off lights uh, during uh, periods of bird migration. I can say for insects, a more critical time uh, to not use lighting you don't need to is at dusk. Uh, so um, that's something to consider. And I will, I guess, state the obvious here. Insects are generally not present during the winter. So you, you are, uh, it's much more important, of course, to use uh, uh, to restrain your lighting use uh, during spring, summer, and fall. Second principle, light only where you need it. Okay, and this has to do with really making sure that light is being directed to the place where you need the light and nowhere else. So lights um, are shielded or not shielded. Okay, which simply means that the, um, the uh, lighting fixture has uh, some kind of um, projection or cone around it that helps to constrain the light to point in a, a certain direction as opposed to a naked light bulb, which is shining light in all directions. Now, it's the case that a lot of street lights and a lot of decorative lights or uh, you know, lights that people have around their homes shine light at the ground, but also shine light upwards into the night sky or horizontally into neighbors' yards or into forest preserves or other places where the light has adverse impacts. So the first thing to do without spending any money is if you have floodlights in your yard, point them down. Don't point them, certainly don't point them so that the light is shining above the horizon, but point them down as much as possible so you are concentrating more light into a smaller area. But what really matters is that you only point it into areas that you need to have lighting in. Then you want to use what's called a fully shielded light fixture, okay? And they have a rating system that I won't get into here that uh, is used a lot commercially uh, when um, uh, organizations or cities want to limit the kinds of lighting that are used to protect night skies and reduce uh, Allen impacts. 
um, there's a rating system that deals with shielding. Um, and, uh, but if you go to a lot of lighting stores or you look online, you yourself can buy uh, shielded light fixtures that are very, very helpful for keeping light pointed down and not up uh, into the night sky or into trees or other um, habitat. You can also use structures, walls or vegetation to screen light sources. Um, this is pretty useful at the edge of your property um, to uh, you know, make it so that you are putting as little light possible outside your yard or whatever space you're dealing with. And another thing anybody can do is make sure to pull your drapes and shutters at night in rooms where you have lights on, if you're not doing that anyway, because you will be, if you don't do that and you've got lights on in a room, I guarantee you there are going to be insects at it at least some of the time. And again, they, are, they cannot take them say, take themselves away from these lights and they will sometimes stay there until they die. Another principle is to use the lowest level of light that you can, okay? Uh, there are, if you go by, I, I'll just use one of sort of the worst case example. If you go by a car dealership, they are classic cases of over illumination. And they are of course doing that on purpose. Um, it is using far more light or having far more concentrated light in uh, a, a given uh, surface than is needed for any useful purpose. And I, it is the case often that people think adding more light will uh, make their environment safer. Um, but that often is not the case because as I alluded to earlier, we have this issue of dark adaptation and an, another issue that I haven't talked about, which is lighting contrast. So if you um, walk from a very well-lit area into a very dark area, you will not be able to see too well, okay? Similarly, if you are looking at an area that is very well lit, the area beyond that light will, because of contrast and the way your eye adapts to the brightness of the light that's immediately in front of you, it really makes it worse for you to see what is in the shadowed areas beyond the light. So you actually may wind up seeing one small area very brightly, but your ability to see the larger environment is actually made worse by having too much illumination. So <clears throat> what you need to do here is to space the lights properly so that they don't overlap uh, in the, the cone that they illuminate. Try and get along with as few lights as you can. Um, and then uh, turn them down, okay? A lot of lights that are outside are simply too bright. I used to have 75 watt lights, you know, on my front porch. Well, do I really need that? No, you need a light on your front porch so people see that you have steps and you might need it to uh, see a doorbell or use a key. You can use a very dim light to do that. And you will definitely be helping all kinds of wildlife if you use lights that are not as bright because they simply don't attract animals like brighter lights do. Um, just to mention, I was out at a conference once in some progressive community in California, uh, walking down the street at night and as I stepped onto a block, the uh, overhead, the street lights had been dim. There was no traffic, no one walking there. There was still light, but it was very, very dim. When I stepped into the vicinity of the light on this block, the lights lit up brighter to illuminate my path. And then after I passed out of it, I saw them go back down to that very low level. This is not hard to do, it is being done. Cities that value night skies and value their ecological resources and are aware when they're doing retrofits or upgrading you know, lighting systems, 
can use these technologies. And although it may cost more to implement it the first time, because they are using less energy overall, they can actually wind up saving significant amounts of money. Um, and uh, this is the second to last slide. I, no, it's the third to last slide. Um, there is an issue of the spectrum of the light that you are using. So um, for a variety of reasons, um, amber or orange or red light uh, is much less harmful uh, on average to most uh, animals in terms of its attractiveness to them. Uh, it also, it turns out, is actually better for uh, astronomers and enjoyment of night skies because it has, um, there is glare and other properties associated with bluish white lights, which tend to emit uh, ult more ultraviolet light, which is highly attractive to some animals. Um, it's more of a problem, and especially with LEDs. So I'm sure we're all aware uh, that we have some really what they call daylight um, LEDs that are using very short wavelength light. They almost can have a bluish hue, certainly a very bright white hue. And then we have the, uh, oh, the name is escaping me, but the uh, you know more traditional appearing lights uh, that are uh, have a, what's called a lower um, light temperature uh, and are definitely to the naked eye more yellow in color. Now, they have uh, wild light, what they're called wildlife friendly lights that are amber, orange, or red. Um, they are usually going to be dimmer. And they have other wavelength properties that have to do with, in essence, stray wavelengths. There are more restricted wavelengths in these wildlife-friendly lights that are available. And they are, in fact, used um, in Florida and places where they have uh, sea turtles that the, when they hatch uh, on the beach, the uh, baby turtles uh, under natural lighting conditions go toward the ocean where they are safe uh, because uh, the reflection of starlight or moonlight off the water makes that the brightest light source. When you have development inland, uh, when these turtles hatch, the brightest lights are not in the ocean and they start walking up the beach. So they actually developed uh, this kind of light in part for the uh, sea turtles but you, I have got one in my, uh, I actually have a couple in my uh, yard. Uh, and I'll show you a picture of one in, in the last slide. So takeaway here, um, avoid using uh, bluish white lights. If you can get dimmer lights, get orange, yellow, red, um, and you will be uh, better off overall. If you want to do the best job, use the wildlife friendly lights, but they are really pretty orange and dim. So I'll show you one you can see if you can deal with it. And then the last thing is light only if you need it, okay? And that kind of ties back into light only where you need it. But what this one uh, slide is really getting at is using alternatives to permanent lighting. Okay, most paths that need, you know, that have lighting have got conventional lights and you can get fully, fully shielded uh, path lights that um, cast light only into a narrow area around the light sufficient to light the path. But there's another option and that is to use reflective markers that don't reflect light or don't create any light at all. They only reflect ambient light, whether that is moonlight, starlight, or uh, mobile lighting that you might have, which is another thing that you can use. So what I'm really talking about here, uh, or where this is most practical, is for areas that don't see a lot of traffic. It's occasional traffic where it's feasible uh, or reasonable to expect that somebody would be able to bring a flashlight 
or uh, simply rely on uh, reflective markers. Where you will see a lot of this is in national parks, which are leading uh, on the vanguard of uh, reducing light uh, so that their visitors can enjoy night skies and they can protect wildlife. Um, they uh, you have a lot of advanced lighting in a lot of national parks, but they make good use of reflective markers on paths and especially on stairs um, to make it so they can minimize uh, the conventional lighting that they uh, need to use. Okay, so that is uh, my presentation. I do want to talk about this last slide. And um, this is the front of my house, okay? And I monkeyed with this a little bit in Photoshop just to darken it uh, so that it more closely mirrored uh, what this actually looked like last night at you know nine o'clock or 9.30 when I took this picture. So what I've got here is a little uh, spotlight uh, at the lower left, that is the light source. It has got a wildlife uh, friendly light. Um, and then I've got a uh, fully shielded path light that is using a conventional light over on the right next to the stairs. So uh, you can get an idea here of what that looks like. And it's pretty different from what we are all used to. Um, it is effective. And so you, you've got to think about um, what works for you. I will say that I don't think my wife is too enchanted with this light, but I want to have, and I'm not myself, frankly, but I uh, want it to be show people and you get used to it. And in fact, it is plenty of light to illuminate um, the house, you know, for aesthetic purposes without harming animals. Now, this was retrofitted to existing lights. If I were to do this all again, I would rethink my lighting plans entirely, but you don't need to do that. You can do a lot of mitigation with uh, existing lights. So I did wanna show you what this looks like and also show you a, a real example of a shielded light uh, but if you look even in communities around Chicago, uh, they are starting to pay attention to uh, municipal lighting systems. And uh, I think uh, a, a mitigation or, or something to do that I didn't put there is to raise awareness with the people making decisions and with your neighbors as well. Um, because don't forget that there are a host of other impacts of lighting at night that include human health effects, and they aren't pretty. <laughs> and uh, it, it's, uh, th they, that kind of uh, impact can also be brought to bear when you're discussing the importance of uh, lighting controls, along with the climate change issue and the need to save energy. Uh, so thank you all very much for your patience. And you, uh, I'm happy to take questions. Yes, if anybody needs to leave because we started a little bit late and we had some issues. So if you guys have to leave, feel free. It will be recorded. I'll record until the end of all the questions. But if anybody wants to stay and and, and ask questions, feel free. We're happy to be here until 8. Well, shall I, um, maybe I should start asking, so people did start asking questions in the yeah. chat, and, and I had a question too, I just wanted to put out there about um, holiday lighting. I've received the question many times about holiday lighting. I'm also concerned about the strings. Is that a concern or is that dim enough? I mean, there's a lot of it. I got to say on my street, almost every house has some kind of a one or another holiday um, lighting set up. Well, okay, let me, I guess, state the obvious, although I've had people ask about this various thing. There really aren't insects out at Christmas time, at least now. <laughs> Maybe there will be, uh, you know, in, in the future when it's warm. Well, I call it holiday lighting, but what I really mean well, is lighting that's up. I'm, I'm talking about now there's lighting on most of this uh, right. out here. Yeah, I, I you know, I, I will say this, all outdoor lighting is harmful. 
okay, at some level. Now, right. I, don't, I don't know that I am aware of uh, studies done specifically about those very, um, well, I'll say a lot of them are very dim. They're, they're not necessarily always dim. And unfortunately now sometimes they're LED and they are, you know, they're not as uh, yellow or, or uh, low wavelength, um, or sorry, long wavelength as um, traditional lights were. Uh, so uh, the best thing to do is, is to not have them now. Right. Uh, Right. That's a really a good answer to your question, but yeah, let me let me go through some of the other things here too. I appreciate your saying that because uh, I do get a lot of questions about that as well. So uh, Jean Smelling Coyote is asking about I think up uplighting outdoors, also the use of cheap LED strips to frame windows seen from outside on businesses should be banned by law. What can we do? Um, there is first, let me say, I don't know very much about the issue of, you know, the lights being wrapped around windows, um, but they, you know, as I said, uh, lighting that is visible from the outside is, um, is harmful at, at some level. Up lighting, that is shining lights up into the sky uh, is very definitely harmful, not just ecologically, but it's, uh, it's a problem for uh, night sky impacts and um, a lot of uh, a lot of things. Um, and what you can do now, I I think it is unrealistic, at least at this point, and this is just my opinion, to expect that municipalities uh, are going to make it so you cannot do that. Um, so I think all you can do is, in essence, do what I'm doing which is spread the word. Now I did um, give to Bia and I have, if you contact me at that email I have, I'm happy to send you a one page fact sheet that kind of summarizes my talk, but half of it is the exact, in essence, the exact uh, mitigation slides I just showed you. You can hand that out at meetings. You can do whatever you want with that, but get people aware that, you know, this is a problem, uh, and yeah. you know, I think the problem is most people aren't even aware of this being a problem. Right. Some people aren't going to do anything, no matter what you say, unless the law requires it, which it probably won't. Um, but uh, other people just need to understand this is a problem, and they'll at least do something to help. Yeah. I mean, natural habitat, we could print up a bunch of those, but I wonder about maybe we, you and I could work on a door hanger because I would be willing to hang it on people's doors that have their, as somebody in the chat also mentioned, you know, that there's a new lights in downtown Evanston that look like Christmas in July. Well, the whole area, the corner of um, Dempster and Chicago has all got strung lights across it now, you know, so this yeah. is more and more. Um, but anyway, I mean, yeah, it's, you, thought, it's, you and I can talk about that later too. Yeah, I'd, I'd be happy to do that. That's a great idea. Um, also, from Jean again, I classified campfires, which we've made for thousands of years, as Alan, but uh, hyper local around human households. But yeah, I, uh, uh, you know, uh, fires do attract a, a certain number of, uh, well, I would think insects, really. I'm, you know, this is partly life experience. I'm a lifelong camper. Um, but it is very, you know, it is, tends, toward lower or longer wavelengths that is to say it tends to be more orange and red. The smoke drives away a lot of animals that would be attracted to it. It's hard for me to see it being much of a problem. I will say, since we came up with that, people have been using uh, artificial lighting for thousands of years to um, uh, either attract uh, fish or uh, what, what have you, or, or for, I was going to say for pest control, but certainly people have been using lights to attract fish mm -hmm. forever. So, right, right. And that is, that is firelight, right? That's what they were using, torches, so. Right. Um, I, that's pretty much of the questions, but Jean did ask, um, again, uh, I, I've seen nearly all night hawks 
hawks replaced by chimney swifts. Both seem crepuscular, but what's the difference in these species menus? Uh, I don't I don't know a whole lot about chimney swifts, and I'm I'm not really a bird person. But yeah. I will say that um, I actually have a nighthawk, which I've not heard in a long time, and they were. I grew up in Wilmette. They were very, very common when I was a kid. I don't see them that often. I never see more than one. And I, or, you know, you don't they see They are them declining. Much. I mean, yeah, yeah the, there's no question. Yeah. I, yeah. I've read a sad thing about, you know, nighthawks and, and whippoorwills that, you know, they fly around with their mouth open to catch, you know, moths. And it just is, there's just not the population of moths. I mean, that's their whole feeding uh, strategy is basically to fly around with their mouth open. That's what they, you saw them doing, you know, and, and uh, it's just a, a way that you can tank a, con a whole population of uh, species. Yes. Yeah. And it's, um, you know, that's the kind of thing that, you know, uh, I think a lot of people in the audience who are older, if you just think about if you drove across country when you were a kid or any long distance away from a city, how many bugs you had on your windshield and how many you don't have now when you right. do the same thing. It's pretty dramatic. And if you start thinking about birds, if you were paying attention, you will also realize that you, in your lifetime, there's been a noticeable change, um, not always decline, but um, in general, uh, decline, at least in certain species. Mm -hmm. And another person mentioned a few birds are singing out early at 3 or 4 a.m. Is this due to lights or some other reason? It um, that's a good question. It could be. I don't I don't know the answer to that. But in fact, I am trying to assess when I hear them. I, I if that person wants to email me, I am happy to look that up. I'd be mm -hmm. interested to know myself. Yeah. I know mine are going around my house. They're going before 4 a.m. <laughs> but it, it's I live in Western Springs and it's pretty dense. It's never really dark here. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a lot of lighting around here. It never really gets dark. Right, right. Well, I think that's a good place to end. I mean, there are a few comments. I'm not trying to leave anyone out, but um, please email um, Bob if you have uh, you know questions to ask. Some were kind of more comments, so uh, I thought I would let that go. But um, thank you so much for coming and thank you so much for presenting and thank you, Bea, for all your enormous help. Um, I really appreciate, you know, spreading the word on this and, and more, uh, you yes. know, Natural Habitat Evanston needs to put, you know, to walk the talk and get its uh, word out here. I do have, I am walking the talk personally. I do not have any outdoor light <laughs> and I turn off every line, I can. But, <laughs> but we need to figure out how to spread the word better and more widely on this issue. So yeah. thanks. If you think there's something that the library can do or anything that we can share besides the, the one pager that Bob sent out, uh, please let me know. And again, if anybody needs that, just send me an email and I can print those and have them available for the general public. That's so thank great. You. Well, thank you so That's much. That's great. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. All right. And remember, this is being recorded. So if you have to go back to it, feel free. I'll send it out probably uh, Monday. Okay. Thank you. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank you. Thank bye you bye. so much, Bob, for your time and expertise. Bye -bye. You bet. Okay.